Let's uh, turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Again, if you didn't bring a Bible, you can follow up uh, on the screen, or you can go back and grab uh, a Bible off one of the bins and follow along. John, uh, chapter 13. I'm going to start with verse 3 and read through verse 11. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, You do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. But Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. Well, uh, foot washing is a strange custom to us moderns, isn't it? I mean, we... uh, we walk on, on paved sidewalks and, and roads. We wear socks and shoes. Uh, besides, it's somewhat awkward to wash someone's feet. Now, some churches, such as the Brethren churches, <coughs> they do it every time that uh, they have communion. Catholics, Orthodox, and Anglicans, they, they do it on Monday, Thursday. But most denominations don't. I married a couple once who actually did it in their wedding ceremony just to, to model, to, to show how they were committed to each, other's, uh, to each other's needs, to serve each other. But in Jesus' day, it, it wasn't a religious ceremony at all. It was very practical. Uh, they wore sandals and they walked on dusty roads that was full of animal manure and garbage. And their feet got dirty and before dinner you wanted to clean up, especially because you would be reclining at table and there was a good chance that somebody's feet were going to be near your face. Such was the case in John chapter 13. Now usually when somebody came to the home of someone for dinner, there would be a servant at the door with a basin of, of water and a towel. The guests would remove their sandals and leave them there at the door because they were dirty. But this night, there was no servant at the door, just a a basin and towel, and so no one was washing feet. No one wanted the job, (coughs) pardon me, of servant. Can you imagine what was going through their heads? Peter's probably thinking, hey, I'm one of the three closest friends of Jesus. I'm not doing this. No way am I getting on my knees. Someone else is thinking, I'm on the official board. This is not in my job description. But can you, pa- can you picture all 12 of them standing around with their arms crossed, all thinking, not me? No way. Somewhat awkward, don't you think? So what happened? Nothing happened. They skipped the foot washing and went to dinner. They would rather have dirty, smelly feet than to stoop to washing each other's feet. Now Jesus is watching this whole mini drama, but he says nothing until after dinner. He gets up, takes off his outer robe. He pours the water into the basin. He gets down on his hands and his knees, and he starts washing the grimy feet of his friends. Now imagine that things got real quiet. No one was asking if there was going to be dessert after dinner. It was an embarrassing moment, but it was also a teaching moment because Jesus was going to use this to teach something special to his followers and to all of his followers in this new movement 
that was going to be radically counter culture. And he said to them, <coughs> Do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And I tell you the truth, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now listen what he says here. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you what? Do them. Do you understand? what I have done for you. There are four things that Jesus wanted his disciples to understand. And the first one is this. The Christian life is a downward journey. The Christian life is a downward journey. You see, in Jesus' day, society was organized like a pyramid. At the top were the powerful, the well-off, the well-educated, and the well-connected. They were the ones in charge. They were the ones who ruled. They were the ones who called the shots. At the bottom of this pyramid were the powerless, the poor, the uneducated, the alienated. And their job was to serve the ones at the top. That was the way things worked. It was never the other way around. Now, if you think about it, things have not changed all that much in the past 2,000 years. But Jesus is calling you and me to an entirely different way of living. And it's hard. And we resist it. Uh, people at the bottom, suffering people, uh, broken people, excluded people are sometimes hard to be with. They remind us of our own pain and our own vulnerability. And it can also reveal sometimes how hard our hearts are, how slow we are to respond to the suffering in our midst. The other day I was serving at the IHN house and I spent the evening with some wonderful people who have found themselves temporarily uh, homeless. And one of our volunteers, Chad Martin, and I were finishing up the evening in the living room, and we were talking about our shared experiences. Uh, Chad grew up. Uh, his dad was a, a Methodist preacher. And uh, we, were, we were sharing our, our experiences of living in a parsonage right beside the church with an endless stream of people knocking on our doors looking for help. And I was about to, to share with him uh, one of my favorite stories of this homeless guy who came to our home one night when just right smack dab, the Holy Spirit stopped me and said, Mark, stop this. I love them as much as I love you. And I sat there with my mouth open. I was completely speechless. And poor Chad, I'm sure he had no idea what was going on. But I thought, why do I forget this? Why do I allow my heart to get hard? You see, God continually is calling you and me on this downward journey. It will look different for each of us, but it has to include relationships with people who are different from us. We can't always hang around those that we like and love who are like us and who look like us. Now for others it might mean much more. I have a doctor friend who, who regularly volunteers at a free clinic in some of the poorest neighborhoods of Cincinnati. But I have another doctor friend who for the last 25 years has served the poorest of the poor in one of the poorest nations in the world, in Nepal. And that just blows me away how he does that. Do you understand what I've done for you? Secondly, it's a, it's a pattern to follow. Notice what Jesus says. He says, I have given you an example. Now, nowhere else do we find that phrase in, in the Gospels. It is clear. It, it is compelling. It is not optional. It is a command. I have given you an example. Now, that word example means literally a pattern. And, and that helps me understand what he's talking about. See, just like a, a dressmaker has a, has a pattern that they, that they put together to make a dress, each dress, though, will be cut to different body shapes and sizes. This last week, Melinda was complaining that designers of women's clothing just gives you one size fits all, pretty much. And so her clothes are usually too long. She always has to have them shortened. But not so with Jesus. He's given us a pattern. He's given us an example. He's given us a model to follow 
for our lives. And it's not optional, but it's up to you and me to figure out what that will look like. For some of our folks, 23 of our folks, for them, that's going to Mexico this week. But we have to find a way to express that in loving service to others as he did when washing the disciples' feet. Great story in in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. Jesus and his followers are out for a walk, and this blind beggar by the name of Bartimaeus begins, uh, he hears that Jesus is passing by, and he begins yelling out at the top of his lungs, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. Now, how do you think Jesus' entourage responded? Do you think they went over to him and said, oh, you poor man, yes, you need Jesus. Let us take you over to him. Is is that how they responded? Do you remember the story? How did they respond? Basically, shut up, you blind, worthless beggar. Jesus is busy. Jesus is important. Don't interrupt this important man. You see, somehow they have missed Jesus' pattern. They've missed his example. Fortunately, it doesn't discourage Bartimaeus. He, he's used to being treated like trash. He just cries out all the louder, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy upon me. And Jesus hears him. Isn't that amazing? He hears the voice of this disabled, poor, socially powerless man. And he stops what he is doing. He says, bring him to me. And they do. And he says to him, What do you want me to do for you? Think about that. What magnificent words the Son of God, the creator of the universe, has time for this guy on the bottom of the pyramid. The Lord of Lords, King of Kings, asks what he can do for Bartimaeus. And in this, Jesus does something incredibly important. He models for his disciples, not just for the twelve, but for all of his disciples in all times and in all places, a pattern, an example, a lifestyle of serving and caring. Jesus does this over and over again. The Samaritan woman uh, in John chapter 4 at the well, the the tax collectors in in Matthew chapter 9, children in Matthew chapter 19. Jesus served all the others. Jesus served all of these while others thought he should not. When I was in college, my friend David and I were serving as leaders in a fellowship of college students. That was connected with our, with our church. But a lot of times, our leadership felt more like a popularity contest. You know, David was very uh, popular, very charismatic. Everybody loved him. But I was the one who got things done. Or so I thought. And uh, in the cases, is I, was, I was jealous of him. And one night, we were having this late-night prayer vigil at the local Christian coffee house, and we were praying, and again, I heard God tell me to wash David's feet. Now, I did not want to do that for lots of reasons, sanitary reasons alone, you know, because we were college students, and David didn't bathe all that much, you know. Those were the 70s, you know, hippies. But you can only resist God's command for so long. And after I was finished, no words exchanged, he washed mine. And something happened that night that changed both of us. You know, it's hard to be in competition with somebody else when you have washed their dirty, smelly feet. And so here's Jesus kneeling at the feet of his disciples. He's modeling a new way of being. He's modeling a completely different attitude towards life, a new way of loving and serving our families, our friends, our neighbors, and even our enemies. The next point that Jesus makes is this, this upside-down authority. When, When Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he was turning their understanding of the exercise of authority upside down. See, we think that leaders need to be strong. We think they should be in control, that they should be in charge. They must never reveal weakness or get too close to those who report to them or who are beneath them. Otherwise, familiarity could breed contempt and their influence compromised. And not surprisingly, when, when leaders of any kind adopt these beliefs, they become aloof 
and distant and inaccessible. For years now, business guru Jim Collins ha has been making the case that this kind of leadership just doesn't work. But this past July, there was a study just released uh, in the Administrative Sciences Quarterly. How many of you read that pretty regularly? Okay. No, I don't see anybody there. And it proved it. This study's conclusion was this, that the more humble the CEO, the more top and mid-level managers reported positive reactions. Top-level managers said they felt their jobs were more meaningful. They wanted to participate in decision-making. They felt more confident uh, about doing their work, and they had this greater sense of autonomy. They also were, to make, they were more motivated to collaborate, to, sh to make decisions jointly, and to share information. Likewise, the middle managers felt more engaged and committed to their jobs when the top boss <coughs> was more humble. It's a proven fact. Jesus invites you and, me, you, and, you and me to exercise leadership and authority in a radically different way. Now notice when he washes their feet, he did not pretend not to have any authority. He said in verse 13, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that is what I am. And over and over again in, in the Gospels, people were saying things like, wow, he teaches with authority. Wow, he, he does things with, with authority. Jesus had authority, but he chose to use it and to exercise it in a uniquely different way than the way everybody else does it. You know, we tend to throw our weight around, but Jesus uses it in this complete spirit of humility. He does it to help others rather than to promote himself. And then finally, a new purpose. We find in this a new purpose. So excited for these um, people who are going on the, on the mission trip to Mexico. Very proud that they would give up a week of their life to serve Jesus. And I wish that all of you could go and, and serve in a third world nation because, folks, it is life-changing. It is transforming to do that. This happened to Melinda and I some years ago when we served on a, on a mission trip to Haiti. Uh, we saw a lot of poverty, and it really, though, hit me the hardest on the very last night before we returned home. We were taking a walk after dinner, and we were walking down the sidewalk, and, and up ahead, there was, right in the middle of the sidewalk, there was this cardboard box, a pretty large cardboard box. And I wondered, what in the world is that doing in the middle of the sidewalk? And so, out of curiosity, I, I looked in it, and there were two children in there who were asleep. And, and I looked around, looking for parents, you know, is, is this the only crib that the parents could afford for their children, and why is it here in the middle of the sidewalk? And, and then I began to wonder, I wonder if these are just two orphans and they've got no place else to sleep, no other alternative. And it broke my heart. And it still does to this day. You see, service is the life that we're called to. It's our very purpose in life. That's the way that, that God ha has wired us. Jesus has totally turned our, our values upside down. We're taught to work your way to the top to show them who's boss, to be in control. And Jesus comes along and, and totally turns that upside down. He, re, he re, redefines our very purpose in life. He makes us a, a new creation with totally new values, totally new lifestyle. Folks, listen, what is it that gives our lives significance? What is it that gives us purpose? What is it that, that gives our life meaning? It's when you give your life away. God has wired us to give our lives away. Now the catch is this, is that God gives us a choice of what you do with your life. He doesn't force you to give your life away for others. You can live a totally self-centered, self-involved, egotistical life and never once give a thought for anyone else's needs. And guess what? No one will stop you. You won't be very satisfied. You won't be very happy. You'll miss out on the greatest blessing of life. You'll stumble through life wondering, isn't there more? Isn't there something else? Why am I not happy? But it's a choice that you can make. Am I willing to lay aside all of my personal ambitions 
Am I willing to lay aside my, my goals, my plans, my dreams, and live only for God and for His purpose on earth? Are we willing to give our lives away so that God's will can be done in our lives? That's a big question. It's a lot for God to ask of us. Maybe you're thinking, well, why would I do this? Why would I sacrifice my plans and my ambitions and, and my dreams for God? Well, here's one reason. He did it for you. Jesus sacrificed his life on purpose for you. The ultimate example of sacrifice is when God sent his own son Jesus to die on the cross on our behalf. No one has ever sacrificed more for you than God. And he did it with no thought of getting any kind of reward. I mean, look at Jesus' life. He used his heavenly privileges for the sake of others. He leaves his throne of, of glory and empties himself of his divine prerogatives. He assumes all of the human uh, limitations in, in being a person. He serves the needs of people around him. He never sought political or, or religious power. He never turned anyone away. Look at the last week of his life. He takes the role of a slave and he, he washes the feet of his disciples as they sat in the upper room on the night in which he was betrayed, giving you and I an example, a pattern, a model to follow. And then he stands before Pilate with no thought of escape, no thought of self-preservation. He did not contend with his accusers. He did not defend himself. He, he did not plead with the judge. In short, he did nothing to stop the unjust execution that was being orchestrated by his opponents. You see, if Jesus had been the unwilling victim of, of those who had conspired against him, if he had gone to the cross kicking and screaming, then he might have been reckoned the object of, of, of unfair and abusive treatment. Jesus went quietly and he went willingly to the cross. And we remember what Jesus said. He said, I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me. I give it up of my own accord. And then we see him on the cross. We see him tortured and bleeding. We see him mocked and taunted. We see him misrepresented and misunderstood. And yet he does not retaliate. He does not attack others. He does not defend himself. He does not seek rescue. And he does not seek revenge. My friends, the cross is the culminating act of love. Of self-emptying love. And it is in that act that God's glory becomes most evident to you and me. This is the God who, having created the very universe, finds joy by placing all that he has at our disposal. And then the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, Let this same mind be in you, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. You see, you and I were created to reflect the very nature and character of God. That means that we are most human when we reflect this character. And we do that when we take up the towel and the basin and we wash the feet of those that God brings into our lives. Don't sit on the sideline anymore. Don't be a spectator. Don't miss the joy of serving others. Remember Jesus said, you'll be blessed if you do it. Do you understand what I have done for you? Do we understand what he has done for us? Do we?